All right, so it is uh, it's Wednesday, and um, and today we'll talk about the R six object oriented system. And so uh, on Monday we talked about the S three object oriented system, and then R technically also has um, the S four object oriented system, and it also has the reference class object oriented system, and. Um, uh, and R6 is uh, another object-oriented system, and I think it's it's a little bit more elegant than the R reference class system. So that's what we'll uh, we'll learn. The um, the key difference between these systems is that so S3 is a generic function um, object-oriented system, and um, and what that means is that the methods belong to the functions, right? So if you have the function, say, shoot, depending on what object you give it, a camera, uh, a hockey puck, a basketball, a gun, or something, the, that function, that verb, will take on different meanings, right? So you have the function print, a generic function, and you have a version of print, print.dataframe, for how data frames get printed, print.default for how things get to printed out by default, you know, print.factor for how factors should be printed. So you have different methods um, of that function. The S4 system is also a generic function uh, object-oriented system, but it is uh, formalized. Because what we saw on Monday was that you could just define a new class by saying, all right, here is object X. Object X, the class of object X is going to be apple. The class of object X is going to be fruit or banana or whatever. And you can just create new, new classes, new object classes, um, just kind of on the fly. And that's, um, you know, there's pros and cons to a system like that. And, uh, and if you wanted something more formal where you're not allowed to just define new classes on the fly, you can, you can learn about the S4 system and use it. Um, I'm not, I'm, we're not gonna cover the S4 system in, uh, in class, okay? Um, there's the reference class, the RC system, um, but we're not going to use that either. And, uh, and instead, we're going to focus on R6. The R reference class and R6 systems both, both use uh, encapsulated uh, object-oriented um, um, paradigms. Okay, And in encapsulated object-oriented paradigms, that uh, the methods, that is the functions, the methods belong to the objects themselves. So in that case, you would have you know, some object like a camera and it would have methods. So what can this camera do? The camera can shoot a photo. The camera can uh, turn on the flash. The camera can uh, record a video. Okay? And you'll have different, um, uh, different methods or functions that belong to the object. Okay? Another important thing is that the R6 objects are mutable, okay? Uh, mean that they are modified and placed, and they have reference semantics. And they'll, we'll get, um, we'll talk about what that means in a moment, okay? All right. So in order to use um, the R6 system, you have to uh, install the R6 package, and you'll call library R6, okay? Okay. And the um, and inside the R6 package, there's really only one function that you're going to use, and that is the R6 class, R6 class function. That's that's used to define a a new object class. Okay, and this is the only function from the R6 package that you're going to use. Okay, um, and when you define a new uh, function or a, define a new object class, um, you're going to have to at, kind of at least define two of these things. Okay, a class name and uh, a list of kind of public fields and methods, okay? So you have class name. This is gonna be the name of the thing you're creating. Um, by convention, we use upper camel case. Upper camel case means um, if you have multiple words, the first letter of each word is capitalized and you don't put any spaces or underscores in between them, okay? Uh, meanwhile, you have public, and this is gonna be a, a list, okay? So it's gotta be some kind of list and the list will contain um, fields like uh, names of different values that, that it can store, and uh, and also methods, which will be functions that uh, that are stored inside a list. Right? Lists lists are kind of these containers like a train, and you can put different things inside of them. 
And so, you know, some of the things you'll put inside will be functions, other things will be, you know, vectors and, and things like that. Okay, and then, and by convention, the, um, the, the fields and methods inside um, public will have a snake case, meaning we uh, separate words with the underscore. Okay, and well, you should always assign whatever um, R6 class goes, uh, should go into a variable with the same name as whatever uh, class name you've given it, okay? Uh, and this will be kind of a, an object that creates, um, uh, this will be the object that defines the class. Okay, so here's a very, very simple example, okay? We're gonna create um, uh, an object class called, uh, the class name is the accumulator, all right? And so this is gonna create, um, uh, objects with the name uh, accumulator, and uh, and we take R6 class and we assign it to accumulator. So we have the same thing here again. Um, upper camel case. So first first letter is capital and things like that. And then um, we uh, we create a list of public fields. Okay, and this list has one field. Okay, and that's going to be sum, and its default value is zero. And then it has one method, and the method is add. Okay, and we know it's a method because it's going to be a function. Okay, so the function, um, this creates a method, and here it's just an, some value, a static value here, uh, and, and that come, becomes the, uh, the field. Okay, and, um, and that's what we have. Okay, this creates a simple class called accumulator. It has one public field, the sum, which has an initial value of zero and one public method add, and it adds X to the sum. Now notice how this function for add is written, okay? It takes uh, some default argument X equals one, okay? So it takes the value X and what it does is it references self dollar sign sum, self dollar sign sum. So, so yes, uh, we have a question about public and private fields. Yes, private fields do exist and we'll talk about that uh, later, okay, that, um, but they do exist. Um, but it references self dollar sign sum. So self dollar sign sum references whatever value is stored inside the sum field, okay? And so, um, so we're gonna take the self dollar sign sum, we're gonna add X to it, and we assign that back to this sum field, okay? And then it returns itself, it returns self uh, invisibly, okay? So let's, uh, uh, let's just take a look at how this works, okay? So if we just say, okay, what is this accumulator that we've created, okay? A accumulator, the result of R6 class is an object generator. It's a generator of accumulator objects, okay? And the accumulator object inside public, it, the default value is zero. It has a method, uh, the add, okay, which is a function. And it also has um, a method clone, okay, which which is also a function. We We didn't define this, but all R6 objects are going to define some kind of default methods and clone is gonna be one of them. Okay, and then it also kind of tells you all sorts of other stuff. All right, so let's, let's take a look, okay? We're gonna create a new class. Okay, I'm sorry, not a new class. We're gonna create a new object of this accumulator class, all right? So I do accumulator dollar sign new, okay? This dollar sign new, um, it's a method that I did not define, but all R6 objects will inherit this method. All, all R6 objects will have it new. And what this does is it creates a new, new um, instance of the accumulator object, right? So accumulator itself is the object generator. X is an instance of the accumulator, okay? So X is one, one example of this. And inside X, we have the method add, the method clone, and the field sum, which currently has the value zero, okay? And we can say, well, what is, um, what's the value inside the sum field? Okay, we just do x dollar sign sum, x dollar sign sum returns zero. And it says, all right, well, uh, the value and it's currently at sum is zero. All right, so x dollar sign sum is zero. I can call this method x dollar sign add, okay? x dollar sign add, we'll call this function, okay? And it's gonna do um, basically self sum, which will be x dollar sign sum, plus the default value, because no value, so 
here the default value is one and it's going to add one to it and that gets assigned back to itself. So when I do that, this modifies the value in self, uh, the sum to one, okay? Now, when I run this, this is on its own line. It doesn't output anything to the screen. It modifies the value in X dollar sign sum, but it does it invisibly and it doesn't show anything to the screen. Now, if I ask what happened to X dollar sign sum, it'll say, oh, sum now has the value of one. Okay, it went from zero, we added one, and now has the value one. But notice there's nothing that gets output after running X dollar sign add, okay? And I didn't have to like, uh, a lot of times if you do something in R, if you wanted to change something, you have to kind of assign the result somewhere. So I, but notice I'm not doing X dollar sign add and then doing assign it to Y or assign it to X or anything like that. I'm just, um, this happens, this modified the sum to one. Here I call X dollar sign add three and the sum gets modified to four, okay? And again, nothing gets output to the screen when you call X dollar sign add, it just does it. Um, and the changes to X and the sum field happen uh, invisibly in the background, okay? It just happens when you run this, nothing gets output to the screen. But when you ask, what is the value of X dollar sign sum? The value is now four, okay? And so, and, and the way it's doing, the reason why is because we're taking the value of sum inside, inside itself and we're modifying it, right? We're doing self dollar sign sum plus X, store it back to self dollar sign sum, okay? Now, one thing to note is that this function the last line is invisible self. And what that means is it returns this object, okay? It returns the object itself. And, um, and the invisible just means even though the object is returned, it's not being printed out. It's not being output to the screen. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to kind of chain method together, okay? So right now the sum is this value of four is the value four. And I could do X dollar sign add, right? I do X dollar sign add 10. And what this part does is it takes four and it adds 10 to it. And so now X dollar sign sum is gonna be 14, okay? But it's returning itself, okay? So it's not returning, it's not returning the sum, it's returning the entire object itself, okay? And so when I return this entire object itself, you can think of this, what I have highlighted in yellow, you can think of this as um, the, the object X now with the value 14. Okay, so this is the object X now with the value 14. Okay, which means I can just call dollar sign add 10 to it. Okay, because this itself is the object X. And so here I'm going to add another 10 to it. And so this entire thing, X dollar sign add 10, dollar sign add 10, you can think of it because it's returning itself. It's not returning just the sum, it's returning its entire self, which includes the add method and all of the other stuff. This itself is the object X. This itself is the object X now with the value 24. Okay. And then so if I want the sum, there, I can do dollar sign sum and I can get the value 24. So these are all changed together and that's what um, invisible self allows me to do, okay? If I didn't call invisible self, if, I, if I'm not having it return invisible self, then, um, then this would not be possible. I, I, would, I wouldn't be able to chain, chain the methods together. Okay, so because the method returns invisible self, the call returns the object itself after running the add method. And then we can call the add method again because the object has the add method. And then we finally we can ask for what's the value inside the field. All right, does that kind of make sense? Did I already give you a quiz answer? I can't remember. Let me give you your first quiz answer for today. First quiz answer for today is B. B as in bear, B as in bear. Okay, yes and bear. Uh, so we have a question of, is this chaining kind of like using the pipe? Um, there, there's some similarities in that you can kind of uh, 
chain things together in that way, but it's it's also different in that you're only going to be it's returning itself, so you only have access to the methods that exist inside the object. Okay, so if a, if a method doesn't exist inside the object, you're not going to be able to kind of chain chain other other methods or other functions there. Okay, you can only kind of chain um, functions or methods that exist inside the uh, the object. Whereas the pipe just takes the output and gives it to another function, any, any function that exists. The, the chain only allows you to kind of chain methods that exist uh, inside there, okay? Now, um, now this is simple. Uh, all of these functions are very, very easy and these methods are simple, but just kind of um, depending on what you've written and what the, uh, the methods do, uh, for readability, it might be desirable to put the, uh, the methods on, uh, if you're chaining methods, to put um, each one on its own line. So here we've got, we start off with the sum, um, you know, the, the most recent value is 24, and we can call um, the add 10 method. And, um, and we say dollar sign, we put the dollar sign on this line because it tells our, you know, it's expecting another thing. We put the add 10 method there, and we ask for the sum field. And then so it adds 10 twice again, and we get 44. All right, so far so good. Okay, so there are other methods, okay? So all R6 objects inherit a new, okay? The method new, and this allows you to kind of create new, um, new instances of this um, object class, okay? And so um, you can create a, define a method, initialize, and what this is gonna do is it's gonna kind of override the default behavior of dollar sign new. It allows you to kind of define maybe required fields for creating a new object. It can let you perform checks when uh, to kind of make sure that the valid uh, inputs being put in are, are valid. Okay, um, I'm I'm copying pretty much all of the examples directly from Hadley Wickham's book uh, Advanced R. So you know I highly recommend that. Um, and so this is a this is an example that um, that he puts in his textbook. And we're going to define, uh, he defines a new reference class, okay? Or, I'm sorry, not reference, an R6 class called person, okay? So the class name is capital P person, and this is what we have. And there are two fields, okay? Two fields, name and age, okay? So we have the name and age, and, uh, and they start off kind of blank or missing, all right? And we create a method called initialize, okay? And what initialize will do is um, it, it takes in uh, a name and age argument, okay? And it's going to perform a few checks, right? It's gonna do uh, a stop if not. A stop if not uh, requires everything inside to be validated to be true, okay? So we're gonna do is character name. Uh, if the name argument or the uh, value being provided for name is uh, character, this is true. If it's not, it's gonna be false and it stops. Uh, and it's going to check if the length of name is equal to one, right? So we want to make sure they're only providing us with one person's name, okay? And uh, and so if that's true, it continues, right? Same thing here. If uh, checks to make sure age is numeric, uh, and if it is, it continues. If the uh, length of age is one, it checks to see if that's the case, and if it is, it continues. And if so, then we're going to take name and assign it to self dollar sign name, which is going to be basically this public field name. We're going to take age and we're going to assign it to self dollar sign age, which is going to be this public field age. Okay. Okay, so um, we can take take the example and we can say let's make a new person. Okay, and we're going to say Hadley age thirty eight. Okay, and we're going to say this is a new instance of person. Now notice, even though the method is called initialize, we call person dollar sign new. I'm not calling person dollar sign initialize. Initialize changes the behavior of dollar sign new. So we're gonna say, uh, let's make a new person Hadley. And this gives me an error, right? Because age here is 38, but it's written in character. So um, so it says is numeric age is, uh, is false or you know gives me um, uh, an error here. And so it doesn't let me do that. But here I can do uh, make a new instance of a person with name Hadley age equal to 38. And this becomes uh, an R6, uh, R6 instance of, uh, of the person, okay? 
at the end. So we can we can say, all right, so this is how um, our six objects get printed out. And, uh, and Hadley is a person uh, in the public field. We have age 38, name Hadley. And then there's kind of two methods inside here. We have the clone method, and that's, that's a method that all our six objects uh, inherit. Okay, and then here's the, uh, the method that we define for initialize, and that's a, that's a function that takes a name and age. Okay, now if you don't like the way this prints, you can define a print method. Okay, if you define a print method, this will change the way things print, right? So when you just type in the name of an object in R, by default, it's just going to print out that object. And so this is the default way um, R6 objects get printed out. So here um, we still define the um, this part all the same, but we also now have the print method. Okay, and so the print method is a function, and this uh, the function is going to um, cat a few lines to the screen. It's going to say uh, first line is going to be person, the next line is going to be name, and we put in self dollar sign name. We're going to take the value stored inside this field, and then the next line will be age, and we do show self dollar sign age, which will be the value stored in this field. Okay, and again, this returns um, like most methods that we define. It's going to return itself initial uh, invisibly. And so now uh, we're going to create a new instance of a person um, where person is this R6 class. And, uh, and we say Hadley, uh, age 38. And so Hadley 2, when we ask for this, it gets printed out using our custom print method. And it gets printed out this way, print name Hadley, age 38. OK, so far so good. OK, so what's important to note is that the, the first instance of Hadley was created using this definition of the R6 class person. And, um, and the second instance of Hadley, Hadley 2, was created using this one. And so the methods are bound to the objects themselves. All right. And so Hadley 2 was created where we defined the print method. Hadley, without the two, was defined where this print method was not defined, right? Did not have that method, right? The methods are bound to the objects created. So it's not, R is not going to go back and update this one to have the new print method that we've given it, OK? This new print method, where it prints it out nicely, um, is, is not, um, was not defined for here, and R is not going to go back and say, all right, let's update all of these old objects or things like that. OK? Um, and, and so there's no actual relationship between this object and this object. OK? They just happen to both be of title person, class person. OK? But that's, but there's no actual like link. Uh, if I change one, one of the things, it's not going to have any effect on the other, right? And so if you're like working in R and you're kind of trying to create some class, um, and what's recommended is that anytime you modify the definition, is you should uh, either delete the old old objects, objects from the old definition or uh, recreate them using the new definition, right? Otherwise, you're going to have like, um, you know, some older versions uh, and different kind of conflicting class definitions, which, which can create a headache. So, uh, so don't do that, OK? Um, so here we kind of defined, um, we said w w you can make classes here. You can also. Um, modify them by using the set method, OK? And again, the set method is going to be uh, something that exists for all R6 class objects, OK? And so here, I'm just creating a brand new accumulator definition, OK, called accumulator. And then we're going to create the field sum and the uh, method add, OK? And we're here, we're doing it using set, OK? Set sum equal to 0, set the uh, method add to be a function where that returns itself, OK? Now, again, because we've redefined this, this new class, there, these kind of exist um, only for like uh, new objects, OK? Um, and they're not going to change any objects that were created under the, uh, 
the old definition. Um, we can uh, define new classes that inherit from other classes, inherit the fields and the methods of another class. And so um, when you define the new class, you specify the super class, okay, the kind of the, the one that it's inheriting from, the kind of the parent um, by using inherit, right? So here we're going to create um, a new object class called the accumulator chatty, the chatty accumulator. And this just is kind of like the verbose version of a function or something, okay? And so we're going to say, all right, this is a accumulator chatty class. And it's inheriting the fields and methods from the accumulator, fields and methods from the accumulator, right? And so the accumulator just has these two, two things, one field sum, one method add, okay? And add just takes X and adds it to the sum. Um, and, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna change one of the methods, okay? The method, we're gonna create a, a method add, okay? Same name as the other one, okay? And here we're gonna say the add method takes uh, is a function that takes an X. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna output this line onto the screen. It's gonna cat adding X and that's it, okay? It's just gonna add, cat this to the screen. It's gonna say adding X, okay? And then it makes a call to the super class method add, okay? So it says, all right, from the original accumulator class definition, um, then call the method add, okay? And then it's gonna call this function um, the accumulator add, and it's gonna add X to itself. Now you might be like, well, why don't you just do self, like self sum plus X, and then you know assign that back to self sum. You could do that, okay? But what if, I mean, so this, this is a simple line, a simple function with only two lines in it, okay? Um, what if this function was a lot more complicated? Like it was like 10 lines of code, okay? If it was 10 lines of code, you know, you might be tempted to just take those 10 lines of code, copy and paste it into here, okay? But um, what would happen later on, let's say you needed to make a change to whatever function this is, then you also have to make sure to remember to make the same changes to you know, the 10 lines of code that you copied and pasted. By making a call to the method that exists in the super class in here, which is just the regular accumulator, you don't have to worry about that, okay? Any changes that you make to the, to the, uh, the super class, um, you know, Will, uh, will will happen here, okay? You just have to, you probably have to, you know, read, you know, of course, if you modify the super class, you have to redefine your objects and you'll you'll uh, redefine your objects here, but but this is just gonna inherit uh, from, from that super class definition. And so you don't have to, you know, copy and paste all of that stuff, okay? So, uh, so here you can reference methods that exist in the super class by using super dollar sign add. And this will say, okay, we're not talking about this method add here, but we're talking about the method in the original accumulator class here, okay? And so here we're gonna create X2. X2 is a new instance of the accumulator chatty object, class object. And, uh, and we say X2 dollar sign add 10. And, uh, and again, we can chain them because uh, the, uh, the super class and returns itself invisibly. So I do add 10, add one, return the sum. And so we can see that indeed it cats the stuff and says adding 10, adding one, and the value is 11. All right. Is that okay? It's, uh, inheritance here. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is, uh, this is what I said. Uh, we define a method add and this is going to override the add method in the super class, okay? But um, the, the last line makes a call to super dollar sign add, and this, this calls the original add method from the original accumulator class, which is the super class, okay? Um, when you uh, call class on an R6 object, it's going to return a vector of all the classes that it inherits from, right? So Hadley, inherits from person and R6. Hadley2 also inherits from person and R6. 
These are different definitions of the person class. <laughs> this one has the print method. I mean, this one has the print method and this one does not, but they just, they both have um, class person, okay? So there's no kind of check here. It just, what, what it reports itself as, okay? And then we can see, you know, X2 inherits from accumulator chatty and it also inherits from accumulator and they're all R6 objects, right? They're all R6 objects that are gonna inherit from the R6 class, which includes the methods like new and um, uh, um, clone and things like that, okay? So there's all some default, uh, default things. Uh, how do you delete the older person class? Um, well, that person class no longer, that definition no longer exists. And if you wanna delete this, you just have to delete this object itself, okay? So you just have to, um, you know, it's just kind of like if, uh, you know, when a new iPad is released, it's not like all of the old iPads <laughs> get changed, okay? If you want to get rid of them, you just have to throw them out, okay? But, uh, um, but yeah, the, the, that definition, you know, you're not going to find the discontinued iPads in the, uh, in the store and you're not going to be able to create kind of old versions, uh, versions of the old thing, unless you kind of kept that definition around. Let me go ahead and give you your second quiz answer. Second quiz answer today is D, D as in dog. D, D as in dog for your second quiz answer. Uh, you can call names on an R6 object and it will tell you uh, kind of all of the things that exist in there, uh, the fields and the methods and so the old person class has the names age, name, along with clone and initialize. Uh, the newer one has age, name, clone, and the print method, along with initialize. The X2, the accumulator chatty has sum, clone, and add, okay? And all of these will have clone, okay? And all of them also come with uh, this dot enclosing environment. That's just something that kind of powers the R6 objects. They all kind of have an enclosing environment that is where it stores the values, okay? Um, R6 objects have reference semantics, which is different from kind of the rest of R, okay? So in the rest of R, this is kind of like what we're used to. Um, here, we're gonna create an object A, which has the values one, two. I'm gonna say, all right, let's, uh, let's take B and assign A to B, okay? And then I do something like uh, take the first value in B and add 10 to it, and assign it back to the first value of B, okay? Now, does this operation affect A, okay? Well, it does not, okay? A remains the values one and two, okay? Because what happens when R sees this operation and says, oh, you're trying to modify the first value of B, okay? The first value of B here, R says, oh, when you do that, I'm gonna make a copy, okay? Copy on modify, all right? And so R is gonna say, all right, B takes on the values 11 and two, okay? Because we added 10 to the first value of B, stored it back into B. So it's gonna take on the values 11 and two, but A, it remains unchanged one, one, two, okay? So modifying B doesn't affect A because when we modify B, R creates a copy of it and then modifies it. So it creates a copy on a mod when we do that. Whereas when we have a uh, reference class objects, here I'm gonna create or I'm sorry, not reference class, an R6 object. Um, R, um, here I create a new accumulator, okay? New instance of the accumulator class object, and that's gonna be X. And then I say, let's take X and assign it to Y. And then, uh, and then we do Y and we do dollar sign add 10. Okay, so this is gonna modify, right? So X, when we create X, the, the sum value is zero. Okay, when we initialize a new instance of X, the sum value is zero. And I say, let's add 10 to Y. And then we say, well, did X get changed? And we say X dollar sign sum, its value is 10. And I say, well, what's Y dollar sign sum? Its value is 10, okay? And what's happening is that X and Y are both pointing to the exact same object, okay? This operation, X gets assigned to Y, they're both pointing to the same thing, right? So here I created this new object X, okay? I create this new object X and, uh, and I'm, I bind the name X to it and it's pointing to this thing. And then I say, okay, 
x, um, let's take y. And we're going to point y to the exact same thing. And so when I say modify this, add 10 to this, the name x and the name y are bound to the same exact object. And so, uh, so that's what we have here. They're, they're referring to the same thing. Okay, they, they show the same value. They're bound to the same object. So, you know, dollar sign, x dollar sign sum, x, y dollar sign sum, both show 10. Okay, if you want a copy, right? So here I'm going to say, let's make a new x object. So here we create a new x object. And uh, what I can do is I can say clone it, all right? So I take x and I clone it. And now I have two objects. I have an x and I have a y, okay? We cloned the x and now it's a y. And so if I say add 10 to y, this, this thing over here has the value 10. This over here has the value zero, okay? So x dollar sign sum carries the value zero. y dollar sign sum has the value 10. And now we have two separate objects. Um, y, we cloned x back here. And this, this defines y, okay? This, this, the name y gets assigned to a thing, okay? So that's, and all our six um, objects will have a clone method, okay? So uh, anytime you create a new one, that's gonna inherit from the kind of the base R6, which is gonna allow you to clone things. So um, reference semantics can, uh, can lead to confusion if you're not careful. Um, they're, they're useful and you can do th um, interesting things with them but they can also lead to confusion. So, um, so just be careful, right? So this is regular old R objects. Here, if I do X is a list with A equal to one and Y is a list with B equal to two. And then we run a function, function on X and Y, and we're gonna take the result of X and Y and we store it to Z. This line, this line we know is only gonna affect Z, okay? There's nothing that's gonna like, it takes x and y as inputs, but when we call a function on x, we know that x is not going to be affected. We know that y is not going to be affected. The only thing is that this is going to run and it's going to output something and we're going to store it to z. We know that z is the only thing that's going to be affected by this line of code. Okay. okay. Here, these are imaginary R6 class objects called list. There's this thing doesn't exist, but we're going to just pretend. This is an R6 object, and this is an R6 object, okay? And so when you call a function on X and Y here, when you call a function on X and Y, and you take that result to Z, we don't know what's happening inside this function, what's happening inside of F, okay? If inside of F, there's a call to like Y dollar sign add, or X dollar sign add, or something like that, then those calls actually modify the object y and the object x, okay? So when you see this line of code, it could modify z. I mean, well, it's going to modify z. I'm sorry, not this one. When you see this line of code, um, well, we're going to assume it modifies z, but is x modified or is y modified? And we don't know. Just by looking at, just by reading this, we don't know if x and y are being modified or not, okay? It, it would require us to look inside the code for F, look inside the code for F and see if there's any calls to something like X dollar sign add or Y dollar sign add where it's modifying those things. And, um, and maybe if it's a, a simple function, it's easy to remember that, but sometimes you'll write something and then you'll revisit it like uh, uh, three months later. And then you have to kind of recall where your head was and what were you thinking and um, and it can be end, end up being tricky, right? Okay, so question says, can we just get around this problem by just cloning X and cloning Y before calling F? Uh, absolutely, you can. So that's, that's one thing. If you absolutely know that you're, you do not want to modify X or Y directly and you just want to take the values stored in there um, and, and put into Z, that, that, that's fine, okay? Um, but um, just the kind of the overall tip here, is that when you create functions that deal with R6 objects, okay, you should make a choice. Is this function going to be something that returns a value? If it's gonna return a value that you're gonna store and use somewhere, then it should not modify any of the inputs, okay? Or you'll say this function modifies the inputs, but is not gonna return a value, okay? And this will help you kind of 
as you're reading your code, if you kind of obey these principles here and just say, okay, if I'm gonna return an object, it's not gonna modify any of the input things, or if I'm gonna modify the inputs, it's not gonna return an object, this will help you read your code and understand it. Now there's no rule that says you have to obey this, okay? So you can write a function that's going to both modify the inputs and return a value. And, um, but that's Ill not recommended because it can lead to confusion, okay? So not recommended can lead to confusion. So here's just like a couple examples. This is an example of a function that modifies X, all right? So here we're gonna create a new instance of X. Um, default passed by reference. So, um, so yeah, what, what it, yeah, it's, so everything is kind of passed by reference here, yeah. Um, so here we're going to um, create a new X object. And here's a function. This function is going to modify X in place, okay? So uh, here it's gonna take a reference to whatever accumulator object we give it and it's gonna call add and it's gonna add five to it, right? And so when you say add five to the sum on X, it modifies X in place. We don't assign this anywhere, okay? And then we can say, well, what's the sum of X? The sum of X is now five, okay? Uh, on the other hand, here I can create a function that just references a field. It doesn't call any of the methods, right? So the method here modifies as X in place. Here, I'm just saying, what's the value stored inside sum? The value stored inside sum currently is five and it's gonna do five times 10 and it returns that. And so if I, if I call sometimes 10 on X, it's gonna return 50 and we're gonna to have to, in order to make use of that number 50, I have to assign it somewhere. So I'm gonna assign it to Y, Y takes on the value 50. What's the value of sum? The value of sum inside X is unchanged and it's still five, okay? So th these are just kind of examples. One where we returned a value, um, but didn't modify that. So here we returned a value, but didn't modify X or we modified um, the input object, but didn't return a value, which is what we have up here. Okay, um, so we had some questions about private fields and things like that. And, uh, and R6 allows for private fields and active fields. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. Let me go ahead and give you your uh, third quiz answer for today. Third quiz answer is A. A as an apple, A as an active, okay? A as an apple, right? That's gonna be your third quiz answer. Um, the stuff uh, that I'm gonna cover on these last few slides and we're probably gonna run out of time. Uh, I ran out of time last session. Um, it's not gonna be on the midterm exam. Uh, I'll talk about what you can expect on the midterm exam on Friday, okay? So on Friday, I'll go over what you might expect on the midterm exam. Um, and also uh, I'll put, post a new homework assignment uh, where you're gonna kind of um, code some board movement stuff on Monopoly. And, um, and you don't need private stuff for, uh, for the homework, okay? So you don't need any of this stuff for the homework, okay? Everything for the homework can be done with public fields, okay? Um, let me just... Uh, And uh, um, okay, so we have that. And uh, so it's not, um, and you can read more by, by kind of reading this stuff here, okay? So, um, so far we've been seeing public, um, public fields, okay? And um, private fields, on the other hand, uh, in an R6 object just mean that those values are available only inside the object and they're not available to be modified or work with from the outside, okay? Private doesn't mean secret, okay? This is not like, don't try to think like this suddenly, you know, things become encrypted and they can't figure out the values. The, the c private is not secret. It just means the values cannot be accessed directly or modified from outside the object. They can only be kind of um, you can only work with them from inside the object, okay? So this is what we had when we defined the person earlier, we had the name and age as public fields, okay? And so when we created Hadley, Hadley's age 
and we can just say Hadley 2 dollar sign age and we can get age 38. Okay. Now with a public field, you can do something like this. You can just say, you know what, take the value to 25 and assign it to Hadley's age. Okay. And then Hadley's age is now takes on the value 25. All right. And this may or may not be something you want to do. Okay. With a public field, you can do stuff like this where you can just modify the field directly. Right. It's almost like a value inside a list. It's technically a value inside an environment is, uh, is what's going on. And you can just kind of, you can just modify it just like that. Okay. Um, what you can do is we can create a private version. Okay. And so here uh, we still have the initialize and we still have the print methods, uh, which will be public because we want those accessible publicly. But we're going to say age and name are now private. Okay. Age and name are private, meaning that they can only be modified from inside the object, OK? So here we're going to create a new uh, new instance of this person, OK? Hadley and age, all right? And so here, because age is a private field, if we say, well, what is age? Hadley dollar sign age, Hadley three dollar sign age, it comes back null, OK? If you try to say, you know, let's assign the value 25 to the age, it's going to say you can't do that, right? Error, uh, error. This is a locked environment. Okay, you can't you can't do that. Okay, because these are inside the private um, uh, as a private field. Okay, but because um, we define the print method. Okay, notice the print method accesses the values in name and age by calling private dollar sign name private dollar sign age. Okay, so it, it has access to those values. So those values are there. And, and when you call print, it says, oh, the name is Hadley and the age is 38. Okay, so those, the, the values are accessible, but no longer, it's not self dollar sign name or self dollar sign age. It's private dollar sign name, private dollar sign age. Um, and then, you know, when we initialize, we're assigning name and age to private name and private age. All right. Is that okay for private fields? Okay. Uh, let's see how far we can get. Okay, active fields. Active fields um, allow you to define something that kind of looks like a public field, okay? Um, but the value is actually defined by a function, okay? And then active fields are created by defining a function that takes a single argument called value, okay? And if the value is missing, then the <clears throat> then this means the value in the active field is being retrieved. <clears throat> and if the value is not missing, then, um, then the value is going to be modified. Okay, so this, this feels a little confusing. But, but here, we're going to create a, um, a class rando uh, with a single active field called random. Okay, so I actually don't have any public, public fields here. And, um, and so here, we're going to say, um, we have an active field, okay? And inside the active field, the active field is a list, okay? List of active fields. I've got one active field called random, okay? Now, it, and at first, it looks like this is a method because it's defined as a function, okay? But because it's inside active, this is gonna be an active field, okay? So this is gonna be a function and it's a function of one value, uh, value. And if it's, if value is missing, it's going to generate a value, okay? It's going to generate a value or re retrieve a value, and the value it retrieves is going to be, you know, one uh, random uniform number, okay? Um, but if you try to uh, assign a value or something, if you try to modify it, if it's not missing, um, it's going to give us an error. But you, you could actually, you know, have it modify something as well, okay? So here we're going to say you can't set random, okay? So here, we're going to create a new instance of the, the rando class. And we do x dollar sign random. So the way we're accessing this looks kind of like we're accessing a public field. OK? Um, but the first time I call, I get 0 0.03584. OK? The second time I call, this is we realize, oh, this is not a static thing. This is the result of some kind of active function. And it gives me back 0.511. Call it again, I get 0.3925. OK? So, so the way we're accessing this looks kind of like we're accessing a public field, but we're not getting, you know, these values aren't static. They're, they're being generated by, 
um, by this function. Okay, and the function is making a call to our unit. Okay. Um, so you can use active fields in conjunction with private fields. Okay, and uh, and what it does, it allows you to kind of implement components that look like fields, look like public fields from the outside, but they provide additional checks, right? Because if it's just a public field, you can do stuff like assign just values to uh, to these things, right? We can say 25 gets assigned to age, right? And uh, and maybe um, maybe you want that, maybe you don't. If it's public, you can't you can't assign or modify, and but you can also call it back. So maybe you want to be able to call things like this where we can call the age, but we want to restrict what kinds of things get modified, right? Because if it's public, it's kind of this all or nothing, right? Public lets you do this or private doesn't, it's kind of an all or nothing. And an active allows you to kind of get some, but not, not the other, right? Um, so I'm already over my time, okay? But here we're gonna say, um, um, you know, the initialize is gonna be a public and we're gonna um, take name and age and assign it to uh, things like this. And so we're gonna have a private value for age, dot age and dot name. So these are private values, dot age and dot name. And then inside the active fields, we have regular age without the name and regular re, regular age without the dollar sign and regular name without the dollar sign, okay? And we're gonna say, if, um, if age is missing, as in if we're not trying to modify it, we're going to retrieve it and we're gonna get the value from private dollar sign age. Um, and if we try to modify it, we'll say age is read only, okay? Um, and if the name is missing, meaning we're just retrieving it, we're going to get private dollar sign name dot name. We're going to get the, uh, the 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 value stored there. And if it's not missing, meaning uh, we're trying to modify it, well, we'll give an error if it's uh, if it's not character. But um, but if it is character, we'll uh, we'll actually allow the private value to be um, to be modified. We're going to do private dollar sign dot name to be modified with the value, okay? And so here, here's a quick example. We've got, uh, uh, so you can read, read through all of this, but uh, just in the interest of time, we're gonna create an instance of Hadley here. And so here I can modify the name to be Wickham, okay? Because it's going to um, check this and it's good and it says, all right, go ahead and name it, or right, modify it. And so when we call this here, okay? What's happening here is this is an active field and it's checking to see if Wickham is a valid name, which it's character and length one, so it's good. And it allows the modification to take place. Here, the active field says, oh, no modification is being provided. So just retrieve it and it retrieves Wickham, okay? Later on, if I try to take 10 and assign it to name, this is an active field and it does this check. Is it character? And it says, oh no, it's not character. It's gonna give us an error. And so, um, so it gives us an error and it says, you know, character is not true. And so it doesn't let us modify it. Okay. And so Hadley for dollar sign name still remains Wickham. Okay. And so, so it allows us to kind of check to make sure like the modification. So, so it looks like this, like here, it looks like it's a public field, but it's actually not a public field. It's an active field um, because it's, if it were a public field, we could just take 10 and assign it to name and it's not going to complain. Uh, there's no checks going on with public fields. Active fields kind of do perform checks like this. And, uh, and here, um, so name is modified age. It retrieves it, but, um, but it doesn't let us do any assignment here because it's an active field. And it says, you know, if, if you're trying to modify it, it's read only. Okay, um, you, can, you can read, uh, try this out uh, and mess around with it. Again, the active and the public and stuff is not required for like testing or anything like that, not needed for the homeworks. Um, but we'll end here. Sorry for going a few minutes over. And um, we uh, will we'll take an end here. I gave you all three quiz answers. I did. Okay, so uh, we'll end here. Uh, have a good night. And um, yeah, and on Friday, I'll go over the, uh, the, the midterm. So um, all right, we'll end there.